This webinar is brought to you by the Active Aging and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Sia and I am the chairperson for the Active Aging and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Today's webinar will be an hour long with 30 minutes for questions and answers. You can type up your questions and you can vote questions that are of great interest to you. The next event is on the 27th of August from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. on the role of mindfulness in positive aging. Let me introduce our distinguished speaker for today. He's, he is Professor Kwa E. Hock. He is Tang Gyok Ying, Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience and Senior Consultant Psychiatrist at NUS as well as Mind Care Clinic at Farrer Park Hospital. He is a member of the World Health Organization team for the global study of dementia. He was formerly head of psychological medicine and vice dean of the faculty of medicine at NUS, as well as CEO and medical director at the Institute of Mental Health Singapore. Without much ado, let me hand over to Professor Kwa. Professor Kwa, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Um, before I begin, I wish to thank the Graduate Club for this invitation. I've spoken before in the club about 10 years ago, and I'm glad to, to, to share our, all our research, all of you. Now. Jeremy, you see the, the picture, okay? Yes, Prof. Okay, all right. So um, this, this talk will be on the Age Well Everyday Program uh, from NUS, which is the first program on dementia prevention in Asia. Before I, I, I talk about our program, I would like to convey to all of you the good news of aging because you often hear the bad news. People say that once you're above 60 years and above, you are of no economic value. And old people often seem to uh, are people who consume so much of the health services that you are sick and frail. And um, you see our moderator, Mr. Jeremy Sia, uh, he's still working very hard and for me, I'm, I'm 72, I'm still working, you know, and many people in the 80s are still working. We're still working uh, in, the, in the service sector and providing for, for care for other people. So then, and also most important thing is the life expectancy of people in Singapore has outgrown that of America or the UK. It seems strange that we often ask people from America and UK to give us thoughts on longevity, how to grow old and healthy. But we realized that in recent years, the health expectancy in Singapore has crossed 80 years. It's about 82 uh, in for, pub, for the uh, general population. Um, and for, men, for women, a bit longer, 84, and men about 80. So and this is much better than North America, which is about 76, and England about 78. However, there are some challenges as we grow older, and these are the rising tide of dementia, the demands on the health services, and then another big question that is not only pertinent to Singapore, but the world, aging in place. As we grow older, can we just, is it possible for us to stay in our own house, or must we all be sent away to old people's home? What can we do that if you want to stay in your own place? And then the final area that we need to worry about is the escalating cost of healthcare. So this study which we conducted here in Singapore is of relevance because if you re remain uh, healthy for a long period of time, then the health cost will be much less for you and be able to um, give you a longer quality of life. We know that you can live longer period of life and keep yourself healthy. That would be something uh, wonderful for only the person for the country also. It's no use growing old and is sick, 
sick at the age of 60 and you go on for 20 years in sickness and in frailty. But you can live on for a long period of time, healthy and enjoying life and good quality of life. That will be excellent. We know about the, um, the rising tide of dementia. And um, so some years ago, in sometime in 1986, when we did our first study for the World Health, about 5,000 cases of dementia. And now it comes about 70,000. 70, you know. And then it looks like it's going up. You know. I remember um, we invited one of the ministers, one of the uh, government officials to officiate a, a, a regional conference um, on aging. And the Ministry of Health presented a, a, a slide, something like that, going up. You know. Then the people from the World Health told me that you should advise your minister never to show this kind of slide because it means as though we, there's nothing you can do, that you continue to go up and up. You know. Because as, as research, researchers in the health sector, we must ask ourselves, can we bring this down? Can we plateau it or bring it down? Just like the pandemic. Cannot let it go higher and higher. Can we uh, flatten it or bring it down? And we know that in today, every day, there's about seven cases of dementia in Singapore. Every day. Every year, we have 2,000 500 new cases. Let me repeat, 2,500 new cases. So if we were to, we cannot prevent all dementias. So I told, I was giving a lecture in Harvard some 15 years ago, and I told the audience that if we can prevent just 10%, that is 250 cases. That would be wonderful. Just 10%. It happens with yourself, with family members, or your friend. They are wonderful. The cost saving is tremendous. And you can, for those with dementia, you can increase the quality of life. It's also be excellent. So we, we, in fact, embarked on the first study in Asia. But from the outset, we faced a lot of problems, a lot of skepticism. People say it's impossible. And I was giving a lecture at Cambridge University. Uh, I was giving a research down there first uh, in uh, almost 30 years ago. And I asked the professor of psychiatry of, at Cambridge, what is the life expectancy of someone with dementia? If you diagnose dementia today, how long will a person live? He told me five years. In 1990, when we set up the first memory clinic in Asia in NUH, 1990 to now, with 30 years of data in NUH, we realized that the life expectancy in Singapore of people with dementia is not five years. On the average, it's 12 years. I look after a, a professor of medicine in, in uh, NUS. He went on for 17 years. And the, my patient who lived the longest, someone with dementia, went on for 21 years with good quality of life. Then the question asked in the World Health is, why is that the Singapore data seems much longer than the one in Cambridge? Well, from our Singapore data, we realized, firstly, almost all my patients with dementia seen in NUH or in my clinic at Farrer Park are sent back home and looked after by the family members. In contrast to in, in England, where I worked for many years, patients often sent to the homes, aged homes, so the family cannot look after uh, people with dementia. And also those who come to our clinic, if we realize that for a long time, that many of these patients had also high blood pressure and also diabetes. So I used to work with a geriatrician and she will help me to stabilize the high blood pressure and the diabetes. And also we advise the family members about diet, advise them to how to prevent falls and ask them to do something like exercise, even music therapy. So we combine all, all these together to help the patient. So with all this in mind, we think that maybe there are possibilities that we can, we can prevent dementia if we know all these risk factors. But we have difficulties in getting funding. The, uh, the government has no funding. You know, I went to talk to people in the ministry, they said, we have funding only if you have a patient. With no patient, there's no funding. I told them that we have people who are high risk, you know, the pre-dementia phase, and we can identify these people who are high risk of dementia. We can do something to, the, to these people, we can prevent it. So eventually we have some friends who help me out. 
And the first study was conducted at Jurong Point. Jurong Point Mall was uh, then uh, managed by the Lee Kim Fa family. They were a very, very philanthropic family. You know, and they gave us a space at Jurong Point Mall. And uh, people who come to, to see us is, is free. In contrast to seeing a, a, a person in NUH, once you enter my clinic in NUH, you must pay me $200. You know. um, but in Jurong Point, it's free. Yeah. We call it Training and Research Academy, T-A-R-A, -A, TARA. So people know about it here. The space is a, a cost about 7000 a month, and the family uh, paid for it. After all, they own the mall. So we're very glad for the family and uh, people in Singapore who are, who are very compassionate. In and also the Kuan Yin Hu Cho Temple gave us $2 million. Um, most of us go there as researchers. Um, we are paid for by NUS, but we need to pay the nurses who work down there. So we are given some money. So what we did was we asked the nurses to go around, around Jurong Point Mall. There are about 50 blocks of flats surrounding the mall. So the nurses will go to every block and to every flat and knock on the door. If there is an old person with 60 years above, 60 years above, we invite the person to the Jurong Point shopping mall at our, our research center called Tara. And we assess them. The assessment will take two days. They'll come first day, two hours, second day, also two hours. A very thorough physical assessment. The psychologist will do very thorough uh, memory assessment, also measuring their, 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 their weight, their strength, the walking, very, very detailed assessment done. So probably at that time, the most detailed assessment of an old person here in Singapore was done at the Jurong Point shopping mall. So what we did was, the first part of it, those who are high risk, those who have a family history of dementia, those who have a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, and also with a history of memory problems, we invite them for a health talk. First thing was health talk. All of them came for health talk. And so they come weekly for a health talk. And um, one day we'll talk about um, diabetes. Uh, next week we talk about high blood pressure. Next week we talk about diet. So everything is different and it's, it's pitched at the level of these people. Most of the people around the shopping mall are, are people who are working class people who work in the factories, some with very low education. So when we pitch at that level, so we had a professor of family medicine um, who helped work together with a lot of volunteers to, to uh, uh, pitch the level of the health education for the people at Jerome Point. So we teach them that. So, and, and once they finish uh, the health education, we divide them into four groups. Um, tai Chi, one group do Tai Chi, one group do mindfulness meditation, one group do music uh, therapy, one do art therapy. And we found out what happened to them after a month, three months, uh, nine months. And this is what we found. Oh, I think I, I missed up the slide in the back again. All right. What we found was after about one month, we measured not only the, the memory, but also the, the, the rate of depression and also anxiety. We found that those with mild depression improved within a month. All right. And then after about three months or four, to four months, Almost all of those who are on uh, music, mindfulness, meditation, art, and, and Tai Chi improved. After three months, all improved. And after one year, the, the memory decline was only about, only about uh, 60% of them, uh, sorry, 40% of them. 20% of them, the memory improved. So our, our, our hypothesis was, with all these, we expect maybe 10% will improve. But now it looks like 20% of them improve. And 40%, 20% of them remain about the same, and 40% of them decline. Whatever we do, there will be a large proportion of those people above 60 whose memory will continue to decline. But if we can improve 20%, that would be marvelous. But what we're going to do is, everyone asks us, can you show us the, what we call the biological change? We do a brain scan. So what we did was we did a brain scan for them. These are the people, the, this is the point zero. Uh, this group are people with uh, health education. 
Uh, this group of people with mindfulness meditation. All right? The person who helped us in that was the late Mr. Wee Sinto, who was the NUS vice president at that time, and a, an expert in uh, mindfulness meditation, been doing it for the last 20 years. And after three months, we realized we, when we do a brain scan again, we showed that even with health education, there's increased number of all these this nodal activities, which increase the, the, the brain activities. But there's more of this brain activities in the people who do mindfulness meditation. So uh, this has been published and it's the first time in the world, you know. Uh, I think uh, our previous president, uh, Professor Tan Chua Chuan, was very excited. He asked me for the data uh, and, and this is the first time. There are other studies done on the brain on, on, uh, for people doing mindfulness meditation. Those are mainly data from North America and their data on young people, you know, uh, it's, uh, university students. This is the first time we've done this elderly people and in, in, a, in an Asian population. And the data has been published and some of you have read it, it came out in newspapers about uh, three weeks ago. And then we also find out that when you do meditation, that a change of the, the colony of bacteria in our gut. You know, in our stomach or in our gut, we have lots of bacteria. There are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. The bad bacteria causes diarrhea and fever in us. The good bacteria secretes also some chemicals that goes to our brain and helps us in our brain function and improve our mood, you know, uh, like serotonin improves our mood. So we found that in the mindfulness study, and uh, there's an increase in number of all these good bacteria. And once again, this is the first study in the world and the paper is now being prepared for publication. And the next one is on art therapy. So this is uh, another interesting study um, conducted at the National uh, uh, Gallery. We want to find out whether um, when you uh, go to National Gallery, will it improve the brain function? Well, this, this was in fact a, um, a study prompted by, by our friend, uh, Professor Pomi Ko. Pomi Ko uh, emailed me once and he said that there's a study in in New York, you know, in which they were trying to prevent um, uh, the deterioration of brain function of people with dementia. People with dementia, they brought them to the art gallery in, in uh, New York, they call it um, the Museum of Modern Art, that, that where the paintings of the castles are down there. You know? And he says that the study is going on. Uh, would you want to do the same study in Singapore? Because the time uh, Professor Tommy Ho was then the um, Chairman of the, of the National Arts Council. So I told Professor Poe, I think we should do something. We cannot just follow the Americans. We've got to do something better than them. Firstly, the American study did not include any kind of brain scan. We're going to do some brain scan. The American study is doing on people who already have dementia. But we will take people with high risk of dementia and we do brain scan to find out whether uh, there's a change. And for this study, in the, in the the American study in New York, they use the paintings of Picasso. You know, um, um, but Singapore, I said, we better use different kinds of painting. And you might see this painting it was on television recently. Uh, uh, it's, it's called Upper Nama Awa uh, Kamu. Upper Nama Kamu. Now, when we show this painting to a lot of old people, I'm I'm sure uh, Mr. Jeremy Sia will know. You look at this painting. You know that it's sometime in the 1960s. Why? Because in the, between 1963 and 65, Singapore was part of Malaysia. Now, in fact, I told some of my medical students that you know, he's a medical student from RI. You know, I told them at one time Singapore was part of Malaysia. Said, Are you sure? You know, see our students, and, 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 yeah, knowledge of history is not too good. You know, between 63 and 65, Singapore was part of Malaysia, and the Malaysian government decree that. All students, if you want to go to university, you must pass the Malaysian the Malay language. So everybody wants to study Malay quickly. And I remember that I also had to go to night class to pick up my Malay. And so, so you certainly you remember. So in, in, this, in this study on art and reminiscence, we showed them a picture and asked them, do you remember this scene? Uh, so they say, oh, remember, yes, 1960s. And uh, you see the, the way they, the, the students dress, you know, uh, you see that the, this lady goes to attend the uh, class so well dressed. You know. Nowadays, I tell you, 
you come to, to, to the um, NUS, the students uh, coming to uh, lectures, they come in t-shirts, shorts, you know, with sandals. But in those days, they, they come even for the tuition, properly attired. I'm not too sure about all of you, I'm sure Jeremy will remember those days we are, we're properly attired. Now things have changed now. If you come in t-shirts, singlets, and uh, uh, shorts, you know, and sandals, they come to lectures. But so people remember all these incidents very well. And the other painting we showed to them is, is this painting also on, um, also on um, um, CNA television recently. Um, it's called, I think it's about the uh, health inspector coming. They call it Igu, Igu, the, the toad coming. So when the old people look at this straight away, they laugh, you know, they remember this scene. This scene is supposed to be uh, uh, somewhere in, um, in Chinatown. And it's the same also in Malaysia, in my hometown, in Patupahat. The hawkers are at the mercy of, of the health inspectors. They'll come and chase them away. Uh, and, and some, in, in some towns, they've got to bribe the health inspector. If the health inspector don't come, they will have to go and bribe the policemen who come over to harass them. And the poor chap, all these, all these hawkers in Singapore, Malaysia, they went through a rough time. And I'm so glad that CNA has a television in terms of reminiscence about the life of this, how hard life is for, for the hawkers. So although we put them all together in, in, a, in, a, in a cleaner place, in a hawker center, in the past, it was all uh, 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 spread out in the, in, in, the, uh, in the community, in the marketplace. So when the old people see this, they talk about it, they remember, and it's wonderful. It, it, it stirred up a lot of memories in, in, the, in all of them. And what we did was, once again, before they start to scan the brain, before and after. And the paper we published just last week, right? And the newspaper, people are very keen. And the, and the uh, principal investigator is Professor Rati Mahindran. Uh, there'll be a press statement next week uh, will come out about the, this, this, this study on art and how it helps to improve the brain function of people. The next one is... Uh, a study on choir singing, choral singing. Um, and I think some of you may remember this lady here. This is Professor Maureen Sarkov. She's an active member of, your, of the NUS Seniors Choir. Um, and she's, she raised um, uh, uh, about three or $400,000 for us to do a study. Her proposal is that if you come together for choral choir singing, can it improve the brain function? Can it also improve the mood? Well, if you think about it, you say, well, it, it, it's possible. You know? And lots of people are doing that for many years now. But everybody looks for, uh, is there any scientific study? You know? So you may say, that, well, I know it might be in your church, you have people who sing in choir, they look very well. But the world is looking for scientific evidence. So, so we, once again, we recruited the people, the old people at... Uh, Jerome, Jerome Point study, the Tara study. And we, um, so we did, it's a randomized control, you know, one group just health education, another group will be choir singing. You have no choice, you know. So some of them told me they never sung their life, you know, so never mind, we, we trained them. And we had a wonderful uh, conductor called Darius Lim. And Darius, the wonderful Singapore jet who gone for training, and even uh, conducted at the uh, Carnegie Hall in, in New York City. So he taught them all, sing together, and they, now this group had performed at Jurong Point during the Chinese New Year, and they also performed to, to the Prime Minister you know, at, at Amokyo Community Centre, and also even at, uh, at the Chine itself. So it's one very, very wonderful. So once again, we assessed them before and after. The, the brain scan result is uh, now being assessed at Cambridge. The Cambridge professors are very keen. Uh, but we also assess uh, their mood. Many of them, we found that their, their depression rate in, improves. And more importantly, more importantly is that they come to know each other better. Before the study, all of them were living in, in flats in Jurong. They don't know each other. But now they come to know each other. You say that their, the social connectivity has improved. And, and most important is that the young old, those between 65 to 74, are caring for the old old. So the sense of compassion, uh, which is very, very important in uh, later life, uh, that the young, people, the, the young old are caring for the frail elderly. So uh, you'll, you'll get more of this result coming up later on. I want to um, 
move on to another study that we did. Um, so, and this study is called the Horticultural and Mental uh, Wellbeing Study. It started off with a visit by old people to Gardens by the Bay. Uh, and it's about a year, slightly more than a year ago, uh, the permanent secretary at Gardens by the Bay, uh, Mr. Uh, the National, National Parks, Mr. Benny Lim, uh, he was very interested and asked me whether I could bring old people to Gardens by the Bay. And I told him that if National Development Ministry could give us a small grant, we can do a study to find out whether gardening or horticulture can improve the brain function of old people. So we brought them to Gardens by the Bay. We also teach them how to grow vegetables and flowers um, and visit botanical uh, gardens. You know. Some of them, you'll be, you'll be amazed, and told me that they've never been to the botanical gardens. Although they've been living in Singapore for the last 50 years, they just work and work at the factories in, in Jurong Point, at, at Jurong. You know. And they were so glad to, to be able to be bus uh, uh, from Jurong Point to Gardens by the Bay, and, um, and we also gave them high tea, you know, give them free admission. And in this study, we, we want to make it different. We took the, some of the blood of the old people to assess whether the immune system improved after three months or six months. And we found that, in fact, besides improving in memory, there's improvement in the immune system. Uh, we call it the uh, interleukin-6. Right. This study, once again, has been published in the World Journal, and it excited a lot of people that gardening can improve the immune system then you're less likely to have flu or cold. You know? And this, this results been, been, been uh, publicized by the BBC in England. They interviewed me and said, is it true? We read this in, a, in, a, in the International Journal, the Singapore study. The first, the first study to show that gardening can improve the immune system of the body. So um, I'll come back to this again. Now, um, with um, the um, increasing number of all these results coming out, um, Mrs. Teo uh, Ji Hien, our patron of the Mind Science Center, suggested that the studies that have been successful in, in Jurong Point on, um, on art, music, hygiene, mindfulness, you should extend it to other constituencies. So this is what we call a translational research. So you see, from, from Jurong Point, the same study is replicated at um, Campines, Queenstown, Yunus, Aukang, Bishan, and the Kong Min San, Pokasi Temple area, you know, Upper Thompson area. So this is translated out. You know, and the, the, the big challenge is, in the Jurong study, we have a lot of professors who volunteer. You know. Here, we train the people in the ground. We train the volunteers, some of them are retired teachers, nurses, who are trained to deliver the health education, the mindfulness uh, practice, the, uh, the horticultural therapy. And this is the first time, you know, no one in a place, no place in the world has done this before. There are three centers in the world doing um, uh, uh, dementia prevention, Singapore, Helsinki, and Paris. It's only the Singapore study that extends outside of the research center into the community, like here in, uh, in all these six, six, six centers. So this is called translational research. And this is very important because people often complain that a lot of money is spent on research. What is the relevance of, the, of all this research that people are doing in the university? So we tell people that this study, although research comes from donation, it is of relevance to people in Singapore because they can prevent not only control their hypertension, control their diabetes, also prevent their de de uh, dementia, improve their, their mood and depression and anxiety. And um, so there are five conditions. You control the hypertension, control your, blood, your diabetes, prevent the dementia, uh, uh, lift up the mood for depression and reduce your anxiety. Now, dementia, as I said, we cannot control all dementia, even if it's 10 or 20%, that's excellent. Anxiety is very, very important because now the, with the COVID-19, lots of old people and young people um, have anxiety. And during the, the, during the lockdown, 
worse. You know, the people are getting more tense, very anxious. They cannot sleep, and uh, and, and people will tell you that business is down. Uh, uh, people are worried. And so this anxiety, you call it COVID anxiety, that affects even old people. So these are things they can do. I was watching uh, this morning uh, American television, CNN. They're telling people to, to uh, do some gardening, something we have done already. They published it. They're asking people to do some music. You know, we already done it already. So whatever we have done, we published the world literature. People, people are picking up all of this and helping their own people. I think that's, that's wonderful. I want to move on to another study, which is halfway through. Uh, it's called Nature and Mindful Awareness Study, NAMAS. So this study is, came on after the... Uh, let me get on back to this, this one again. Uh, you see this the therapeutic garden from our studies is here. Uh, N Parks has started a therapeutic gardens. There are five of the therapeutic gardens in Singapore, one at Fort Park, I think one more in uh, Tiong Baru, another somewhere in the, on the west on the west side, I think it's a UT area. There are five. And this is special for, for seniors because you go to the gardens, there's something for smell, some for touch the sun for taste, all the five senses down there. So it's something wonderful. And, and so the, the, um, the um, Nature and Mindful Awareness Study, uh, it, it, it came about um, from our gardening. I met up with our, um, our previous Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji, and, um, and the Chairman of N Parks, Mr. Ben Lim, and asked them, why not we do another study? I love to go to the botanic garden, especially the, the, the rainforest. You know? And I told them, can we bring a group of old elderly people? You see here, some of them are retired civil, civil servants, retired professors. We go to the gardens and then find out what happened to them to their physical health, their mental health, and also their social health. Because many of them don't know each other. Now, after walking for 10 weeks, they seem to know each other better. And also, I told them, can we have someone from N Parks? One of the, uh, the research, researchers come along with us who will tell us what trees are this. Is this the Tembusu tree or is it the Julotong tree, the Sinkona tree? So that we learn about the trees and also learn about the flora and fauna of the rainforest. And if people begin to learn the, love the rainforest, and I think in other countries, then they may not want to destroy the rainforest. The, 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 the hypothesis is if you love the rainforest, you won't destroy the rainforest. Uh, and that would be wonderful for humanity. I made this uh, suggestion in a World Congress when I was talking about our research Singapore study. And the chairman of the, con of the Congress was a man from, professor from Brazil. He told me that is the most wonderful proposition because he said one of the reasons we're having global warming is because of the destruction of the rainforest. And he said here, there in uh, Brazil, the Amazon rainforest, people are destroying it. One of the causes of global warming, the destruction of the rainforest. And you may not know that, uh, I hope if you all visit the Botanic Gardens, walk into the, uh, the rainforest. It's near to the Casa Verde Cafe, you know, the Nassim Gate. And you will realize, realize that in the world today, there are only two cities, only two cities in which there is a rainforest in the city. You know, one is Singapore, the other, the other is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So we, sh we should treasure this, this, this rainforest. So we walk through the rainforest and, um, and we have all these seniors here and some of them are, are this is uh, I mean, this, the uh, Speaker of Parliament, some of them are very senior government officials. And we realized that during the, the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, they began to care for one another. Not only, only did they develop a, a compassion for trees, they also develop a compassion to care for one another. A few of the people in this group are widows or widowers who live alone. So other people will ring up, can I help you to buy your, your grocery? Can I get a mask for you? And so this, this kind of empathy is very, very important. You know, people talk about aging in place. So uh, I helped the, the um, N Parks uh, for the last few years. And so they told me that I would, I would like to reward you by asking you to plant a tree in, in, a, in Hot Park. So I selected a tree uh, with my two grandkids and my wife here. And I selected a tree, the nutmeg tree. And then the, 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 the manager of the park said, why do you select the nutmeg tree? Well, I told him that 
The reason why we are speaking English today is because of the Nut Lake Tree. Because 600 years ago, there's also a pandemic in Europe. They call it the Black Death due to the bubonic plague spread by, by uh, fleas and rats. You know. And there was no cure 600 years ago for the, for the plague. As someone told the people in Europe, the cure for the plague is the, the juice of the nutmeg tree, or the nutmeg. All right. So they were all of them rushed down to the Portuguese who first came. You remember your history. The Portuguese, uh, uh, Vasco da Gama, rounded the Cape of Good Hope. And the Portuguese, and he came down to Goa in India. And then the Portuguese fleet under Alfonso de Albuquerque came to Malacca in 1511 and conquered Malacca. And the first thing he did after the conquest of Malacca was to send two ships to the Moluccas Island in, in Indonesia looking for um, nutmeg. And nutmeg was in an island called Run. So after the Dutch, after the Portuguese, the Dutch came and then the English. And, and um, so people were looking for a cure. Obviously, we know that the juice of the nutmeg did not cure the bubonic plague. But this is to let you know that a lot of things in the, in the history, uh, in, in our garden, that's wonderful that we can learn about. You know. And in fact, the botanic garden is so interesting. I, I didn't realize it until um, uh, some years ago, I was chief examiner here in Singapore in medical school in, in psychiatry. And um, we, in Singapore, we often have external examiner come to uh, university so as to maintain the standard. And our external examiner come from England, Australia. And one day, one of the chap from, from London came down and uh, the exam ends, ended about uh, 12 o'clock. He said, can, I, can you bring me to the botanic gardens? I said, it's so hot, you know, there's no one look at a tree. You know. He was looking for a tree called the Javier Brasiliensis. I think um, if you are, I think if anyone you outside there in the, in the audience or Malaysian, you know, because we studied this in, in SEC 1 in geography, Javier Brasiliensis is the rubber tree. You know. And um, you may not know, but uh, the rubber tree, the, the, the huge multi-billion dollar rubber industry in, in Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, it originated from the botanic garden. Um, almost a hundred years ago, uh, the British smuggled some rubber trees from, from Brazil to the Kew Gardens in London. And from there, I think about 30 saplings were taken down to the botanic gardens and, and grown here. And from here, it moved on to the first plantation Apparently, it was in Malacca itself. So, so the people are so interested in, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the rainforest and botanic gardens. Okay, I um, want to move on quickly. Um, now, the Singapore diet. I was talking to uh, Jeremy earlier on. Uh, in every meeting that I go to give a talk, someone asks me what kind of diet is good for the prevention of dementia. And so, um, I, we are doing some research on this. Um, and. Uh, we are going to find out what kind of diet, how can we cook the diet. But I think we should be proud of our diet. I think uh, I was talking to Jeremy also that I, I had a, 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 I had a, a relative from Malaysia who came down for treatment here at NEH. And he was on this, the last stretch and he was quite uh, dying really from cancer. And I look at the food in NEH, I say, this is not very good. So he wants to eat char kway tiao and, his, and, and char siu pao. Give to him, after all, it's not, not many days to live, you know. So we're trying to do something, whether we can improve the, our hawker food you see here. This is uh, at Durong Point Mall. And uh, at level four, there's a restaurant called Malaysia Bole. And uh, the boss is this man here, Tan Fei Siong. And Fei Siong uh, invited some of our researchers together. The wonderful food. You have a Penang Kui Tiao. Uh, you have a, we have also a Pok Pia and all that. And a, a Klang Bak Kut Teh. And um, so we're trying to see whether we can, we can have some of this and maybe it, included in the uh, hospital diet. The research is still in progress. Another one is uh, Chinese tea. I, I love Chinese tea. And we've done a study to show that those who drink tea has less deterioration of brain function. You know. Now the question is, what kind of tea? You know? And our study found no difference, whether it's a, 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 a poor tea or, or, or a green tea um, or Sri Lankan tea. You know. The study in Netherlands or Belgium found that it is poor tea that's better. The Japanese claim that the green tea is better, but our study found no difference. You know? and, and so we think in general that tea has some qualities to prevent, uh, uh, to, to disrupt the, 
the death of brain cells, and that will help us in our brain function. Another study in progress is calligraphy. Uh, this calligraphy study was, uh, uh, um, was suggested about two years ago, but now because of the uh, pandemic, uh, we, the difficulty in, in uh, getting people together. But this is work in progress. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting study with, uh, uh, that we're linking up with people in the community itself, and we'll let you know when the results come out. Okay, um, I want to move on to just the end now. Um, and uh, this is a study that is going on. It's, uh, it's around the um, Toei area, Toei Drive, near uh, Beauty World. This study came about uh, because a, a dentist spoke to me and said, hey, uh, don't you know that dental health is very good, very important for old people? He said, definitely. And now we realize there is, a, there is a, a theory that poor dental health lead on to infection of, the, of your of your mouth, and infection spreads along the, the big vessels of the brain and affects the blood supply of the brain and makes you more prone to depression and also dementia. So there's ongoing study going on. And then we realize that it's no use just being a piece of a de for dental problem, a piece for a brain. Why not we come have a total assessment of the old person? And uh, at the uh, in NUS here in the tower block or NUH, we have the biggest group of, of concentration of experts in this part of the world. So we asked the um, eye specialists to come along and join us to assess the eye. But also the, the ENT people, the ear, nose and throat specialists. Uh, we also have the heart specialists, the uh, bone specialist osteo for osteoporosis, and even people for the stomach area, and, uh, uh, and also people in terms of gait, um, and uh, sociologists, anthropologists, the whole team is so big now. This is, and this is the probably only center in the world that there's the highest concentration of researchers. And all this is to do a study, whether we can age in place. And we realize that aging in place is, is something that we must know in terms of knowing the generation. Um, so whether the, the family can, can come together to support the old person, the family, and also the community. So we call the study Community Health and Intergeneration Study. And we want to find out whether when people are living in a place, can they stay on, enjoy the, the, the birds on there, their friends, you know? But we want to make sure that the family itself, the people in the family want to care for old person. Some years ago, uh, some RI boys came to see me and they said, we heard about your research in old people. Can we join you in the research? So let us do something simple. Let's do a survey in your class and find out in your, your, your class how many people are staying the grandparents and how many people are not staying the grandparents. And then we find out the attitude of them. We found that those people who don't live with their grandparents, their attitude towards aging is, is, is very negative. Because they say they, they watch television and they always see the minister uh, visiting old people's home, uh, day center, and old people are lying in bed, frail to them. Once you're past 65, you're sick and frail. That's not true. Uh, most people are about 65, like myself, they are still healthy, still working. You know? But those people who live with their grandparents, they have more positive attitudes towards aging. You know? And even tell in a survey that they are eager to look after their, their parents or their grandparents when they grow old. Whereas the one who never lived with their grandparents felt that maybe people who are old should stay in old people's home rather than stay with, with the family. So, come on. so there are many people in, in, the, in the community, uh, in the family, they don't know very much of the family. Uh, um, yesterday, I was running my clinic in, in the university center, and I asked the, uh, uh, a student, uh, a law, I think it's an art student, what's your father doing? Said, well, my father works in, in a factory. Which factory is it? What do they do? Said, I don't know. Your mother, my mother is doing the admin work. Which, which, which company? I don't know. They don't know very much. So, um, so I said, what do you do then? When we often stay at home, I, I do my computer, and we have maybe eat separately. So the com although they're living in the same family, they don't know about their parents. So a study, uh, we're going to do a study now, whether how we can build up intergenerative study. And we're doing it together with our, our, um, our anthropologists and also something on volunteerism. And the question is whether we can change behavior and values. Uh, uh, in the, in the community. I want to move on very quickly. Um, okay, so um, 
So we're, we're thinking something about all this research, but you realize that um, in, the, in, in, in China, we have thought about this more than, more than um, 3,000 years ago, about these three deities that represent longevity, prosperity, and happiness. But what we want to know is, is to do whether we can age well and, um, and live happily. I'm going, to, I'm going to move somewhere because my battery of this laptop is running very, very low. So um, whether we can age well and age happily. But you look at the three deities. Uh, I think I said that the Chinese knew about this long, long time ago, that you want to have prosperity, you want to have good health, and you also want to, to um, have um, a happiness. Um, but it's important also to realize that maybe the ancient Chinese have forgotten that um, all the three deities are a bit overweight um, and all of them are men. And most of the old seniors who live beyond 80 years are the women. So they are not right in that area. All that I've said uh, is in this book called The Colors of Aging. It's, uh, it's been published, uh, it's been reviewed in the British Journal and um, the, the review said uh, this book should be read by Bill Gates because two years ago, two years ago, Bill Gates told the world that um, told the world that he would give one hundred million dollars to whoever can um, whoever can um, can find a drug for the prevention of dementia. So the reviewer, who is a professor in London, said you can never find a drug the prevention of dementia, but you should actually look at, at um, uh, this study done in Singapore on what they have done for the prevention of dementia. And so if you, um, if you um, have the time, you can at least not with our li library itself. But the reviewer also mentioned that uh, this book is second, second uh, to him. To him, a better book is a book that I wrote some years ago called the Cut Listening to Letter from America. And this is based on a true story of the Singapore elderly who survived the Second World War and the story of elderly people who are uh, resilient. And it's based on true story. Um, and when I wrote this novel uh, some 10 years ago, I couldn't find any, um, any publisher. You know? And they said, one publisher from the Straits Times, uh, the editor rang me and said, I heard you've got a manuscript. I said, yes, it's, it's about, you know, she asked me, what is the story all about? I told her it's about elderly people. He said, oh, nobody reads elderly people in Singapore. Singaporeans read two kinds of books, stacks and ghosts. Nothing about, about aging. Don't, don't, don't. So eventually, a, 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 a publisher published it. And it took a long time. And suddenly, somebody from America, the professor of anthropology from America, chap called Michael Fisher, read his book. And he said he used it in the book now in, 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 in America. This is the only novel in Singapore used in America, in Harvard University in a course on anthropology, about old people, about resilience. Uh, and you may ask me why Letter from America. Letter from America is a, the longest radio program in the world. Started in 1946 until a few years ago when the, the, the journalist called Alistair Cook died. And, um, and one of the person I interviewed in, in, a, in, Durant, in a Chinatown was old doctor. And he told me that I'm almost blind, I'm 80 years old. I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, watch television, but I love to listen to um, the BBC program Letter from America about, uh, about the situation in North America. And this old doctor from Singapore said, I'm so amazed that this journalist now, almost 80, 90 years old, will still speak the world about, about um, America. So I wrote all the stories, old people who survived the war, and, and uh, the novel is called Listening to Letter from America. And I tell you what, um, uh, it was read by our, some, a friend of mine sent it to our late president, S.R. Nathan. S.R. Nathan read it and he, he sent me a note and said, hey, uh, Dr. Kwa, could I invite you for lunch? They're sure, president, since you're gonna pay for it. Um, so one day we, we, we invited for, for dinner and, I, and he wanted to see me because he said that, you may not, you, some of you may know that S.R. Nathan grew up in, uh, in Moa, which is quite near to my hometown, uh, Batu Pahat. And he told me that every time he crossed come to Singapore, he passed to Batu Pahat, he stopped over at a, uh, at a, at a shop uh, owned by my granddad, my granddad, uh, and he would have a chat with the person down there, my grandfather. And, and so we had, have a, so we had an interesting conversation about the days in, of his youth, you know, although I never see my granddad, he passed away before. 
But it's an interesting story for you to think about, to read about. It's also available in the library. So I think, um, Jeremy, I have finished now and I'm waiting for questions from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. It is indeed a very uh, interesting uh, talk that you have gave us. A lot of things that, a lot of points that we can uh, take from there. Um, for participants, if you have any questions for, for Professor Kwa, please type in your questions. Um, Prof, I have a question here. Is PSP, pulmonary supranuclear palsy, a form of dementia? Well, Can um, effect that's right. Now? Well, this is a, it's, it's, it's not a very common condition. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the causes of dementia, but it's not a very common. The commonest kind of dementia we have in Singapore and around the world is Alzheimer's disease. All right, Alzheimer's disease runs in a family and it's a very slow uh, illness, all right? And uh, this majority. And uh, the second commonest is the dementia linked to stroke, all right? After a stroke, the part of the brain dies and you develop dementia. The third commonest is a combination of Alzheimer's disease and the stroke of dementia. Supranuclear palsy is not common. Just like people ask me many times, is Parkinson's a cause of dementia? Parkinson is also a cause of dementia, but not common, all right? Uh, the other causes of dementia, uh, uh, um, head injury, so you find that dementia is commoner among boxers, football players in America, very prone, England, are more prone to dementia. A couple of very well-known football players, you hit the ball, you knock the other, head injury. Also, uh, people who drink a lot, alcoholic dementia, and also uh, people who are, who, who are deprived of, or who don't take a balanced diet. And, and uh, I've seen quite a number of people referred to me from old people's home with a deficient in the vitamin B12 and, and folic acid. Folic acid is found in, a, in vegetables. The folate is foliage, you know, so vegetables. So supranuclear uh, palsy, not common. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Another question we have here is, have you done any study on mahjong and dementia? The link between mahjong or games playing uh, and dementia. I'm not too sure who asked that question, but this was this was a paper, was the first paper published by our team about 15 years ago. Uh, it won a big prize in a, in in a, in, a, in, in a world prize on, on research, uh, and, I was, and we went to Osaka to receive the prize. And before I went to receive the, the, the prize, um, I was a phone call from the prime minister's office. Mr. Lim Boon Heng, minister, he said, are you sure I read in the newspaper that all of you won this prize about mahjong is good for the brain? And he said, when you come back after receiving the prize, I'll never chat with you. So I had a long chat when I came back with Mr. Lim Boon Heng, and I told him it's true, you know, in this, this study, uh, that we found that people who play mahjong has less uh, decline. And then people say, is it truly, is it really about uh, playing mahjong? Or is it the social interaction? Well, it, it can be both. You know, yeah. People who, uh, who besides the uh, coming together, there's less isolation. You, know? you, you come together to chat your friend. And also in Mahjong, you must also help you in the memory, isn't it? You must know what kind of tiles your friend throw it or throw down, you will keep them. You know? So you, a lot of memory work involved, but also the social interaction. You know? I want to believe in both. Now, because sometimes in a, in a in meeting, the, the, the strong debate, some people say, no, it's nothing to do with Mahjong. It is social interaction. But I like to believe it's both. And uh, well, because we, we did a study and, and give us a lot. Of, the other study which we, we did, which I didn't tell you about, um, because there's so much of data to give you. We did a study, we found that those people who eat curry are less likely to have a memory problem. Reason being curry has turmeric and, cuc and cucumin, and those are very strong antioxidant, good for the brain. And uh, so now, in fact, you go to cold storage or some of the, the pharmacy, you can buy curcumin or turmeric, uh, uh, Capsule, they can, can eat it. Yeah. But I can tell you that last night I, I told uh, Mr. Jeremy Sia that last night I gave a talk to the, to the Millionaires Club in Singapore and I knew this question would come out. Someone asked me, hey, what about coconut oil? I tell you it will come out. And I tell people that, okay, coconut oil. But it's not just coconut oil by itself. Not only just playing mahjong by itself. You cannot say, I just play mahjong, I don't care. I, I just can't bother other diet. It's a combination of all. So remember what I mentioned to you? The study in the in a Jurong Point 
First is health education. Health education stabilizes uh, your high blood pressure, your diabetes, your diet. Uh, second part of it, you do mindfulness meditation or mindfulness practice. You know? Very simple. If you have any difficulty, you just go and Google Mind Phi. M I N D Mind Phi F I. One of NUS students has done this app. It's for free. You can do it for five, 10 minutes on simple meditation. It has to calm your brain down, reduce anxiety. So, there's something that you can do. And the third one is exercise. So, remember these three yeah? health education, exercise, and mindfulness, and and exercise this tree. And often you combine your art and music, you know, and that'd be wonderful. Uh, um, in the related questions, which is not uh, uh, typed in here, what about exercise? Is there, um, is there an, any research be, that links exercises, uh, based That's right. exercises? Please remember I, I mentioned about the, the Jurong study with Tai Chi exercise. That's right. Right. So, um, so everybody thought that uh, Tai Chi exercise will be the first uh, activity that the old people will like, will cause an improvement. Mm -hmm. Of the four activities, art, music, Tai Chi, and mindfulness, we thought the exercise would be so wonderful that the, 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 the mood or the depression rate will drop quickly, exercise. But it turned out to be music, the one that most people enjoy the music first. Exercise was last, you know, you know, which is very amazing because some of you may remember that, uh, I, <laughs> the trouble is most people, uh, Mr. Jeremy Sia, most people don't read newspapers now. <laughs> Straits Times, it's religious, drop down. It was in the newspaper because we published it in the, in the World's Journal about the Jerome study. And then uh, now um, CNA, uh, our channel News Asia, uh, make a program with, um, with this um, actor, director called Adrian Pang. You know Adrian Pang? is right. So Adrian Pang was asked to do a, a, a program on our study at Jerome Point. So he came, his crew interviewed me and all that. Then he went on to Jurong Point, interview old people. And he said, oh, this is very strange. Huh? He said, I thought that exercise would be number one. You people would, all of you will enjoy exercise and then do it well. And then your mood will improve, memory improve. But it looks like exercise, the last one improved. Why? And then the old people told, told him, we don't like this kind of exercise. We don't like Tai Chi. You tell us dancing, we'll enjoy dancing. So it's what kind of exercise you like to do, you know? Some people enjoy dancing, some people do enjoy meridian flapping, some do, you know, it's walking. You know. So whatever you choose, you know, rather than force them. So in the Jurong study, we, we told them, you have no choice, you have no Tai Chi. So it's our choice, no choice, the income is difficult, you know. So by, by, by choice, most of them prefer dancing. And so, so we are thinking, of, should we launch a study on dancing? And, and we thought maybe this could be helpful. Okay, exercise is very important. Okay, thank you, Prof. A question for you right here. What can you suggest seniors should do now to cope with anxiety during this pandemic? Okay, all right. Uh, so once again, this was, uh, this was in the Straits time, they asked me, I got a, the seven habits of effective uh, methods to reduce COVID anxiety. I think the, the Remember when this came out, we were all in the, in, in the quandary of where's the news? And there's got news from here and there. So the first thing I tell people is get on to the right source. You know? Don't listen to all the kind of news people send to you, social media, about the, the, that you're, there's a case, whether in a particular mall or the neighborhood. It's a lot of fear. You know? I mentioned in a, in a, in a talk um, in, in a, on, on, so on television that so channel, channel 8, you know, that there's not only a the COVID pandemic, there's also a pandemic of fear. You know, all right, how to reduce the fear. The fear is worse when you get wrong information. So I tell people that listen to the MOH uh, uh, website and look at it, they tell you that. Uh, so every night I will just, um, uh, at 10, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, just listen to the one channel and it's, it's all. Other people look at it. Our CNA, BBC, they can look at all, so many tab channels and seeing all the bad news get more frightened. So just listen to this one, right? The second part I, I mentioned to them that is, I think it's important for us to, um, to be occupied with something. You know? So I think whether you're doing a gardening, you're doing uh, uh, art or music. You know? The third part also uh, to um, be involved also in uh, some mindfulness meditation to calm your, your mind down. 
And then also your diet. Make sure you have the balanced diet. Fifthly, also if you can, have a, a sense of, of care or compassion for other people. Look around for other friends. Uh, if you are a younger person and you look at neighbors living alone, ask them what you can do. This sense of compassion, you call it loving kindness, is very good. You feel better that you're helping somebody. Yeah. All right. And um, I think this is about the, the, the five main important ones we need to do. Yeah. And also, as mentioned, the relaxation therapy is like, important for us. Right. And I, I think this kind of a webinar is important that you can raise any question and with your friends and can discuss with you and not to be socially isolated. Thank you, Prof. Um, a question on the book, Listening to Letters from America. Uh, is it available in our library? Yes, Listening to Letter from America. Letter of America, the BBC program, is available in our library. If you, if you cannot, you can. It is published by a British, now it's published by a British company uh, called Austin Macaulay. Uh, uh, but it's available in our library. I hope it's set up a library. So it's down there. And, uh, I, and I tell that the, the people at NUS um, is used in Harvard. In, in NUS, they don't even know it. It's not, you know, so this is, it's only normal to use in Harvard. Why don't you use it here? You know? Yes. Okay. Um, we got one more question. Okay. We got two more questions before we uh, end the sessions. One is uh, how about word puzzles and Sudoku? All right. All right. So all these are for mental stimulation. And I, thought, I think it's, it's fun to have all this stuff. I think it helps you. But this is only one of many things you must do. And you have to do crossword puzzle is very good. I think uh, uh, people enjoy doing it. But I, actually, I find that it's better if they do games, uh, uh, board games like Scrabble. Uh, so I have a, a doctor who has dementia. So I, I, I told a dentist of dementia. So I, I told the wife to play Scrabble with him. So it, this, the Scrabble score gave me a, 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 a gauge of how, how much he's progressing or how much he's deteriorating. Right, so, uh, and that kind of words to use, but, but uh, um, playing puzzle, all this also very interesting or, or very good, or even playing chess, right? something you use your brain. Right? Okay. Um, can you explain, or this, this is an interesting question, can you explain why so many highly intelligent people, highly educated people are affected by, by dementia, Alzheimer, Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's. So, um, it is, it is, now, it is both for educated and those with poor education. You know. Sometimes education is depending on when opportunities. Um, and um, I was giving a talk in my hometown and I, a, lot, a lot of very bright people, but because the opportunities were not there when they were very young. And, and so when they finish off from O level, they straight away they go for teaching. You know. But some of us who have got opportunities, we, we go on to university. You know. Um, and I was given an opportunity, I, I got a shot over to England and I fortunately got a place in Oxford. And these are opportunities that come along in life. Uh, so it's not that the people in my hometown, they are not they are educated, they are educated. It's only that the, uh, the opportunities are not there. And sometimes they were there, they didn't pick it up. You know? um, so someone asked me, why do you do, you do uh, geriatrics? You know? I was trained as a child psychiatrist in Oxford. You know? But I came over here in Singapore to work, and there was a scholarship, you know, so I applied it, and I got it. In America, they went to Harvard to geriatric. So similarly for people here, it's not, it, I, I'm not too sure of this argument about education. But why are people, some, some of the professors have the dementia? Sometimes it runs in a family. You know? I look after a professor of medicine, the sister also my patient, also a very bright girl, and the sister also a bright tree, all runs in a family. You know? And I was asked to go to Malaysia to, to assess an uh, elderly teacher, not elderly teacher, a middle-aged teacher, you know, and you're wondering whether could this be early onset dementia. You know? And it, it, he was only about 50 years old or 49. You know? And we, we found that the, um, in some, some Malay families, they, they marry within the family. You know? uh, I think the father and mother were both uh, were cousins. You know? So uh, uh, this kind of uh, genetic uh, predisposition make them more prone to dementia. And the parent also has dementia, so it runs in the family. So those are those that are with, uh, people with high education, there's always a family history, or sometimes because they have a history of stroke, you know, stroke, smoking, alcohol, stroke. Although they are highly educated, they enjoy the alcohol and all that. You know, so they're more prone to dementia. But I think we should, with all the information we have, I think we know that there are things that can be done. At one time, uh, at one time after I did 20 years of research, I wanted to 
to abandon this research on dementia and move on to depression. Because depression, the outcome is better. You know? I can do psychotherapy and medication, the patient recover. As a doctor, you will see a patient recover. At that time, about 20 years ago, we don't know very much of dementia. Uh, it was no man's land. And now we know, hey, there are things we can do. And that's why we move on quickly to the prevention of dementia rather than trying to get into it. Once it, dementia sets in, it's more difficult to lift them out of it. Easier when you are before that. And we found that the bigger, pre bigger prevalence of people, we are the pre-dementia phase. So now the good news is also that the Ministry of Health tells you that the, the prevalence of dementia is 10%. That means if there are 100 of you listening to me, 10 of you are dementia. But now we found that it's not true. Our, our Jurong study, five, only 5%, half of it. You know. And if we can reduce the half to just 2%, it would be wonderful. You know. So the many things, the good news is there are many things we can do now. We know some of the facts now. And so remember, it's health education, uh, maintaining your good health, the blood pressure, diabetes, and the diet, and then your exercise, and then the mindfulness are the three things. Obviously, you're adding your Sudoku, your music, art, you know, that will make it life more interesting. And, and, uh, and attend all these talks, a chat by Jer Jeremy, it'll be wonderful for you. Thank you, Prof. Prof, last question. Um, this is about food. Does eating ginkgo helps? Ah, the same <laughs> question asked last night uh, about ginkgo. Uh, ginkgo um, well, the research has been done. Um, I've spoken to my Chinese friends who did the research on, on the ginkgo. They, they found that it may be helpful for the pre-dementia phase, you know, before you have dementia. But once you have dementia, then you, 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 it doesn't help at all. You know, you know. But also, the, the only caveat, the only uh, caution you have for ginkgo is many old people also take a, a, a medication to thin the blood, you know, you know, warfarin and all that. If you take it as a medicine because you have some heart problem, you got to be very careful because it prolongs the bleeding time. I have a patient who came to see me who complained of blood in the, the urine. You know? And uh, he said, I've seen a lot of doctors. So I asked him one question. Are you on ginkgo? Said, yes, no, take it off. You know, take it off straight away. You know? then, then the bleeding stops. You know? So I think uh, um, it may be helpful for pre-dementia, but with people with dementia, you can be, be careful, especially those who are on warfarin or any of the blood thinner. You know? do, you serve, do you serve ginkgo in your, in your restaurant, Jeremy? No, we do not. No, no. <laughs> but food is a, is, a, is a wonderful thing. We can spend another one hour on yes. food and, and a memory. And, a, and a, we, in fact, we have a, a publication. If you come to our department, you give a publication to the Mind Science Center. There's a publication on food for the brain. And, mm -hmm. and if you, I don't know whether May, the deputy director, is listening in, you can ask her for a copy. It's, it's, it's good. Okay. All right. Okay. Another question for you, uh, Prof. Rediffusion was enjoyed by the older generation because of the stories that was told in dialects. What are your views on this speaking and using dialects? All right. So, see, when I went over to um, do the research in, in, um, in, in uh, Chinatown, all of them spoke to me either in Hokkien or in Cantonese. No? In fact, I interviewed, you know, that, that storyteller, Le Ta Sa. Le Ta Sa. Is it Le Ta Sa? The storyteller, the master storyteller. And he was, in fact, very angry you know, with the government. He said it affected his livelihood. You know, he cannot speak. He said, how can he tell the story of the three kingdom in Mandarin? It must be in Cantonese. And then it goes on and on. You know. So, um, but now, what he mentioned is, is very good in terms of storytelling. Uh, one of the ways I help a lot of people, uh, some of the, those who are better educated, I tell them, in fact, a retired doctor, I told him that I, the wife complained to me that he is always sitting at home doing nothing, you know, and he's grumbling. So I told him that, why not you write the story of a life? And then he's a GP. He told me, well, my life as a GP is, is so boring. Not like you people, the professor, university, your life so interesting. Mine is very boring. I said, never mind. You just write the story of how you become a medical student and how, how is your cleaning stuff. But it's very interesting because I... He, he, he told us that he was a medical student during the war years, you know, and, uh, he, and he was a fourth year medical student. And one day, in sometime in December of 1942, he left the emergency department of SGH. And as he looked up in the sky, there was Japanese warplanes you know, coming in. They all ran for cover. 
and the, the Japanese dropped a bomb and killed five medical students. Ah, so he, he told us that his friends, they carried the bodies to, um, to behind the College of Medicine building, which is the present MOH building. You go behind MOH, there's a plaque down there that says, here is the burial ground of five medical students. So something which we never heard about. And then he said, during the war years, the medical school, because the Japanese took over SGH, and the medical school moved on to Tan Tok Seng. And then the Japanese took over Tan Tok Seng again. Then the medical school moved on to Malacca. All right. So I, I, I confirmed with one of our professors in, in NUS, uh, Professor Jia Jin Singh. And Jia Jin Singh said, it's true, he's a, he's a historian. The medical school was in Malacca for one year. And so this person wrote all these things, you know, all, all the stories. Of, and he, he became very absorbed. You know. He enjoyed after that, he would sleep well, and he didn't publish a small little book. So he find that this is called narrative therapy. You know. And he became, uh, some of the anxiety, the fear he had, the warriors came out, you know, his anger, his, 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 his sadness about things. But it's therapeutic. He came out, all his feelings came out. We call it a catharsis. You know. And so this is a, a way that, so I, I tell all people, um, why not write a story of your life? If nobody wants to buy it, it's okay, but at least you'll, you can leave something for your legacy, for your children to read about the story of your life. And many people who are, in fact, I'm writing a story with uh, the Speaker of Parliament, uh, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji. We're walking in the, the gardens. At the end of the walk, we have, we, allow, we have coffee together, and we ask someone to speak on something, so someone to talk about their life. And almost, almost 80% of the of this group of baby boomers, in their youth, they come from very poor family. You know. But now they become professors, become perm sec and all that, you know. And they say it's interesting because they're live, you know. We, we didn't realize that they the kind of background. And it, it's like the story of Singapore. In 65, Singapore was very poor. Now it come up, you know. And so these people help out. And it's very, very therapeutic. And I hope the um, NUSS uh, or the, the Bridget Clark can think of something like that. Jeremy, you can take uh, a leadership in this. Let them all. By the way, our um, the previous uh, chat, um, History professor uh, Jiang Haiding, uh, he, he ran a course on narrative therapy. Call him back again to, to, to write me. I, I think you'll come out with a very, very interesting story. And it's, uh, and it's wonderful to understand people that, because sometimes the children don't realize, that, wow, now he's staying in a big house and big uh, condominium. He didn't realize the father and his youth it went to difficult times and, and, and uh, you know, able to survive, what they call an undefeated mind, mental resilience. Okay, thank you, Prof. Are there any more questions from, from the participants? No more questions for Professor Kwa? Well, Prof, I'd like to say thank you very much for a very interesting afternoon. We certainly learned a lot from you and um, and we can get together later on. I'll try to find out some uh, famous Teochew restaurants for us to dine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like to you, take this opportunity to thank all the participants. Um, oh, there's some more questions coming in. Okay, now more questions. Sorry, Prof, you have to hang on for a while. What kind of food is advised to prevent dementia? Ah, good question, Ray. So I'm thinking about, as, as uh, Jeremy talked about, what kind of Teochew restaurant food. Uh, uh, so the Teochew like to eat fish. Uh, of, of course, we prefer a pommes frites. But salmon and, and, and a cod is high in, um, in uh, omega-3, which is very good. Um, but we also love vegetables. You know. But th this is where I, I disagree with uh, our Teochew friends. The Teochew like to eat all those uh, kiam chai, all those salted <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> all this kiam chai is not very good for your blood pressure and all that. So we prefer broccoli. The broccoli is very good for the brain you know, in function of broccoli. And also nuts, uh, nuts, all kinds of nuts are good. You know, uh, um, and also we're, su we're suggesting that you take le a vegetable with a lot of leaf. You know, like, so spinach is a very good vegetable. Well, some people say, well, this is so uh, springy, very difficult. If you, so I tell some of my patients, why don't you mince the spinach? For some old people, a problem with dentition. And I, the dental health is very important. So if you have a problem with dental health, they cannot chew properly. So why not you mince the, 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 the spinach? You know? So it's wonderful for, for them. 
Um, and then fruits, uh, I, I, I told them that things like grapes, the red grapes and black grapes better than the green grapes. Uh, so these are the things that, and of course I mentioned earlier about turmeric, uh, uh, curry, good, you know, and the uh, tea is great. Some friends had found that it, it asked me about coffee. You know, I don't drink as much coffee and tea and, and I'm more partial towards uh, 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 green tea. You know? So I, I told the tea is something that I, I prefer. You know? mm -hmm. So these are the, but many areas we haven't explored yet. Well, food is a big area. And another big area is the traditional Chinese medicine, a lot of food and the herbs and all that. So I often ask my friend, uh, Professor uh, Hong Hai, who is the TCM expert at, at NTU to come and join me in our talk. In fact, on the 9th of November, he is giving a talk uh, from the Mind Science Center. I don't know whether, I think May is listening now. Um, in the Mind Science Center and Hong Hai is speaking on the ecology of longevity and uh, with a focus on TCM. And I hope to give you a head start you know, on what, because they're limiting the, the number of, of, of people zooming in. Right? So, so this is about diet. There are many things we don't know about. We are, we are doing a research on it. Okay. So, and, um, follow up to that question. What about health supplements? Do they really ah, help? Right, 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 right. So I think um, when I was working at, at uh, I was doing my research over at Harvard, I was the only one in the clinic who did not take any supplement. Either. Everybody will take vitamin E. But now they found that vitamin E has no relevance, so they'll stop now. Yeah. Um, other supplements like calcium, people take calcium. Um, I tell people, if you have a low calcium uh, uh, blood level, then you take calcium. You're, if your calcium in the blood level is normal, don't take calcium. You're only wasting your money. If you have too much calcium, you're more prone to stone, kidney stone, gall stone. You're more prone to stones come hit you. you know, right? um, and if you have a balanced diet, uh, uh, and why do you need to take a... a Vitamin B12 or B6, if you're if not vegetable and all that. Uh, um, sometimes the supplements are safe, you know? um, but sometimes is the, the supplement is in a capsule. The capsule causes irritation to the stomach. So some people complain of, of diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome. So you've got to be very careful of the capsule itself. You know? Okay, that's great. One question for you, uh, Prof. Is it possible to work with you on one of your studies? Who is asking me the question? <laughs> we have lots of a lot of things going on. Uh, a lot of the, so the, uh, the the present moment the, the Jurong study is winding down now, but it's the uh, the study at uh, Toei area, uh, the community and and, uh, uh, and the inter intergenerational study is carrying on. Uh, you want to come as a volunteer? You can um, you can send me a note. Yeah? Uh, the other study at uh, at the at the uh, the botanic gardens is, is also going on. Let me know what you want to do. What you do. I welcome people to, to help us out because I think it's good to do research that people who have, can volunteer, you'll benefit themselves also. And, and the research should benefit people. For example, this study in Jurong now, people in Indonesia want to know about it, Malaysia, and also in China. You know? And it's one of them is non drug approach. And it's it, things you can do. You, know, you don't want to spend too much money. You know, you know, right? And it's, it's, it's an, a non-drug approach. No side effects, you know, you know. Make sure you don't run too much before, that's all. Just walking aside, that's all you need. Okay, thank you, Prof. Any more questions from the panelists? Any more questions from the participants for Professor Kwa? Well, there isn't any, Prof. Okay. If, anything right. else you'd like to add before we close the session, Prof? Okay. So, uh, firstly, I want to thank all of you for your participation. And also, Jeremy, Mr. Jeremy Sia, and, uh, and uh, the Graduate Club. So, I think you, I hope you will not just listen. I think the worst thing is to just listen and go back home and sleep. I hope you spread the good news to other people. Say, hey, there's a good news, you know. You can prevent dementia. These are the things you can do. You don't have to take a drug, you know. Uh, as that reviewer the British Journal said, you can do your exercise, you can do your mindfulness. Mindfulness, you don't go attend uh, classes in India or, or Sri Lanka. You can down, download the web, the, the app from, uh, from the Google uh, called MindFi and also health education. Uh, you, can, you can read a bit of, 
If you go to NUS Mind Science Center, there's a lot of information about the study and what you can do. So tell tell your friends, tell your family, and so that you spread this way. Because um, if you if you are healthy, it's good for the country, it's good for the Ministry of Health. You can spend. In fact, someone told me, hey, you're now in the private sector, why do you do all this prevention? You're seeing less patients. Said, no, we don't. There's so many patients. <laughs> we want if, if people don't spend too much, don't go to the clinic. The the the, the queue in the outpatient clinic, the polyclinic is so long, you know, you know, you can reduce it. That'll be wonderful. The doctors are out now. I look after a lot of doctors who are almost burnt out now because of COVID uh, anxiety, uh, COVID uh, 19. You know. So, long hour working hours for doctors, and, and they are so stretched. You know. And even our, my own clinic in uh, NUH itself is so packed with people. You know. If we can reduce all this, that'll be a wonderful place. You save your money uh, to see the doctors. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Prof, for a wonderful afternoon. And thank you, participants for joining us in this talk. And uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.